because I got notes on top of notes on top of notes on top of notes. So we're going to get through this. Today's message is called The Blood. It's not what you think, but it's going to wind up being what you think. The supporting scripture, what, what, what I'm going to do in the beginning is I'm going to set some foundation first. So you guys will have an idea of where I'm going, what God wants to reveal, what God is talking about. First of all, God is a God of blood. He establishes his covenant through blood. He forgives sin through blood. He heals through blood. The throne of grace is founded upon blood. And you need blood to enter into the presence of God. Now, all of this, I'm going to take you to the beginning and take you to the back, and then we're going to fill in the middle. All of this, ultimately, at the end of the time, is filled through the blood of Jesus. Blood is very important to God. The word occurs 405 times in the Bible. We're going to to take a journey through the Bible, and we're going to show you the importance of blood, the power of blood, and namely the blood of Jesus. If we want to experience true revival in our life, because revival means to remind us of something that is important, if we want to experience true revival in our life, we have to go back and start at the beginning, and that is the blood. And we need to make the blood the center point of our life. Now, for all intents and purposes, I'm going to establish some foundations, and then we're going to get into the story. The first foundation we're going to establish is in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. And it's about sin. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. That's very important. So take this nugget and stick it up there because we're going to come back to it again. One of our supporting scriptures in this message is going to be Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 reads like this. And according to the law, one may almost say, All things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There's no forgiveness of what, you ask? There's no forgiveness of sin, okay? So now, we're going to take this nugget, and we're going to stick it over here, too, because these two are going to be our champion nuggets, okay? These are our champion scriptures, because they're going to come all together. You're going to see a picture that is unwinding in the Bible, from the book of Genesis all the way into the crucifixion of Christ, then we go into Revelation. We're not going to get into Revelation. That's, that's the deep water stuff over there. We're not, we're not going to mess with that today. We're going to, we're going to stay focused on, on, on blood. Now, remission is taken from the word remit. Remit means to release from guilt or penalty thereof. So in, 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 in the verse 9, Nine, Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. There's, there, it takes away the guilt. When, when, the blood, when blood is applied to sin, it takes the guilt away. The scriptures established a standard about sin and how it is dealt with. However, the standard was actually stated and set forth in motion in the book of Genesis, where the first sin was committed. Everybody knows about the first sin, right? We're all familiar with the story of Adam and Eve and how God laid the consequences for their disobedience. Let, let's go to the scripture. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. So they had already sinned, and in God being a just God, he has to levy out punishment. You sin against God, he has to. Let us, that, that's just part of his nature. He's, he's just. The, I, I always said he's a God of justice because the, the scales have to balance Amen. when justice comes. It has to balance. You committed a sin, okay, there's got to be judgment for you. So to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. You, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam, he said, because... They're accomplices. <laughs> they, bo- they both sinned, okay? To, to Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, which means you put her above me, which, which is actually spiritual idolatry because you're supposed to listen to God before you listen to your wife. Yeah. You're supposed to listen to God before you listen to your husband. That's how it's supposed to go, okay? So because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, curses the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your 
of your life, both thorns and thistles. It shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Okay, so they sinned. Now let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 3, 21. Because when you look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, and if, you're, and if you just read it casually, you, it, it won't say nothing to you, but, but there's something hidden here. It says also, actually, let me have the NLT. Let me, I think it reads better than the NLT, what I want to point out. Yes. The NLT reads like this. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins from Adam and Eve. Stop right there. Let's go back and take our supporting scriptures off the shelf, okay? The wages of sin is what? Death. They sinned. Adam, the first man, introduced sin into a perfect world. What was sin doing? It started the process. Oh, this is good. It started the process of death. Now, the character of God, take that, stick it over here because we've got to bring all this stuff together. And, <laughs> this, is, this is good stuff. <laughs> because God is holy, there is only one way that God responds to sin. This is part of his character. How God responds to sin, how God always responds to sin is he hides his face. Every time you sin, he hides his face. It's established in Isaiah 59.2. And the prophet says, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and God, and your sins has hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you. But God had a plan. Tell somebody, God had a plan. Because God did what? He loved man. He loved his creation. He said, I set judgment on them, but I don't want to have to hide my face from them. Because when God hides his face from you, there goes your blessing. When God hides his face from you, there goes, there goes your protection. When God hides his face from you, darkness comes. Let's look at some examples. Because everybody, everybody, it's funny, through the scripture, everybody has the same response when God hides his face. In Ezekiel 28. And when God changes your name, he changes your destiny. Understand? In Genesis chapter 4, 13 through 14, Cain. It's about Cain and how, and Cain said to Yahweh, my punishment is too great to bear. Look at verse 13. Look at verse 13. Look at verse 13. Look at verse 13. My punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have, because what happened was, what happened was, what happened was, what happened was, let's back up a little bit. I'm getting ahead of myself. What happened was, Cain and Abel, they were doing sacrifice to God. Cain did a little bit of the fruit and everything. Was like, mm, I did a good thing, and God and, and Abel presented blood. He killed the good of the lambs and the fat. He offered it to God. God looked favorably because God's a God of blood. We'll get to that in a minute. But he's, he's a God of blood, right? So Cain gets jealous because God's looking more favorably upon Abel. So Cain says, Hey, bro, let's go for a walk. And he kills him. Now, this is important. So this is another nugget you got to take and stick it over there because we're going to come back to that. So he kills him. And Abel's blood is crying out. So here's a revelation for you. Blood speaks. So Abel's blood's crying out to God from the ground. Vengeance! Vengeance! So God hears it and he says, hey, Cain, where your bro at? He's like, my, my brother's keeper? 
And he says, uh, his blood is coming up from the ground. So in Genesis 4, 13, 14, and Cain said to Yahweh, my punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have, watch this, watch this, driven me from this day from the face of the ground. Because you got to remember, Cain got his living from plowing the ground. He, he was a fruit. So God, because of sin, watch this now, because of sin, God took his livelihood away from him. Because of sin, he lost his money. Because of sin, he's going into debt now. Because of sin, he can't pay his bills. Come on, somebody. Because of sin, he can't give his offering anymore. Are you with me now? Because sin does what? It brings death. Everywhere sin comes, it has an agenda. I'm going to kill it. I'm going to kill it. I'm going to kill it. That dream, I'm killing it. That hope, I'm killing it. That word you got from God, I'm killing it. Because that's what sin does. You have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I will be hidden. Not only have you cursed the ground, God, you have told me to get away from you, and you've turned your back to me, and I'll be hidden in darkness. No more glory, no more power, no more life. And then in Matthew chapter 27, 45 for 46, I want you to pay attention of how this transpires, because then you'll get the magnitude of how all these people felt when God turned his back because of sin. <coughs> now, from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land. That is the beginning in which God turned his back. He took away the light. He took away the direction. He took away the unction. God turned his back. He said, it says, now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is my God, my God, have you forsaken me? Because it is at this time that the whole weight of the sin of every creature in the world, every boy and girl, every mother's daughter, every son was placed on Jesus and God saw the sin and God had to do what his character demanded him to do, what his holiness demanded him to do is to turn his back. Okay, so we got that. We got that established, that when God sees sins, he turns his back. He turns his back. He's turned. So let's go back to the garden. Come on, let's go. Let's go back to the garden. So now, sin brings death. Automatically, it brings death. Death is coming. God knows death is coming. But God doesn't want to turn his back. He loves man. So, yeah, we need to go back to uh, Genesis 3.21, please. He loves man. So God says, <laughs> I gotta play it. Because God always has provision. He always has provision. He always has provision. He knew that they were gonna sin. He's, it, wasn't, it wasn't something that caught him off guard. He knew it was coming. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. So also from Adam and his wife, the Lord made tunics of skin and clothed them. NLT reads better. So without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. God kills two animals, one for each offense, one for each person. God forgives them of their sin. But God also made a judgment upon them, didn't he? He had to because he's justice, but God makes provision. Animal skin, animal hide, does what? It protects so not only did God forgive them of their sin, God said, I had to put judgment on you, but now I'm going to protect you Amen. because I'm God and because I'm love you. I, gotta, I still got to cover you. So now I covered you from the judgment that I set on you because I forgave you because I provided the blood. Now, the important thing about the blood you will find out. And why it's so important back then is because of something that it had inside of it. Blood is so sacred to God that he made an everlasting ordinance about it. Not just Jesus' blood, just blood in general. Because he's a God of blood. Remember, he established a 
covenants with blood. In Genesis chapter 9, start with verse 3. Let's use the NLT. We'll stay in the NLT. He says, I've given them to you for food, just as I've given you grain and vegetables, but you must never eat any meat that still has the life blood in it. Pay attention to that word, life blood in it. And I will require the blood of anyone who takes another, another person's life. If a wild animal kills a person, it must die, and anyone who murders a fellow human must die. If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. For God made humans in its own image. So now God is establishing why blood is so important. Because it has in it life. Everybody's blood has life in it. Everybody's. The birds, the animals, ours. Who's the life giver? So everybody... In this room, outside, every animal has a little bit of God in them. So what is God doing? He's protecting himself. (laughs) He's protecting himself. I made them in the image of me. They got my life force in them. So you can't can't do that. You you, you can't spill the blood. You You can't spill the blood. Spill the blood. It is so important that even after the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus, in Acts chapter 15, verse 28, we have new, con- we have new converts coming from the Gentiles or coming into Ju- Judaism. Well, not Judaism, but Christianity by the Jews. And they're trying to ask, yeah, that's Acts 15, verse 28. The disciples are asking the Holy Ghost, they're praying to the Holy Ghost, saying, what other... What other requirements do we need to place on these Gentiles that are coming in? Because we, they're like, well, we don't know. Is, is it just, you know, believing in Jesus or whatever? So they're asking. For, and then after they pray, it says, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. So they got the direction from the Holy Spirit. They got the direction from God and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these requirements. You must abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming once again, blood over meat of strangled animals. So that commandment, that ordinance never went away from the Old Testament into the New Testament. So it's one of the few that God took out of the Old Testament and said, ah, blood's still important to me. It's still, got, it's still got part of me in it. It's sacred to me. So I'm going to pull it into the New Covenant too because the New Testament is a new covenant with better promises and blah, 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 blah. Okay, we, we got that. Okay, so... He didn't omit it. Now, in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10 in the NIV, I'll read it, but God is setting up the reason about blood. Watch. Are we there? As Leviticus uh, chapter 17, verse 10 in the NLT. And if any native Israelite or foreigner living among you eats or drinks blood in any form, I will turn against that person and cut him off from the community of your people. For the life, for the life of the body is in its blood. I have given you, the, now watch this now, because this is very important, because you're going to take this, this little section, and we're going to put that over there too, because you're going to pull that out later. <laughs> I have given you the blood on the altar. Who gave it? I have given you the blood on the altar to what? Purify you. Purify you makes you right with the Lord. He's talking in third person, but you can, see, you can basically say it like this. I have given you the blood on the altar to purify you, making you right with me. Watch this, watch this now, watch this, watch this now, because this is the mystery, this is the secret. It is the blood given in exchange for life. Watch this now, now take that and, put, and go back to the garden. It is the blood, God's given the secret now. He, he did the ordinances and everything, and now he's explaining why blood is so important in the Old Testament. 
And then we'll see how it's even bigger important in the New Testament. But anyway, so watch this, watch this. Watch. It is the blood given in exchange for life that makes purification possible. That is why I have said to the people of Israel, you, sh- you must not, you should never eat or drink blood, neither you or the foreigners among you. So watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. Now we're going to do application of the mystery that God is applying. God said, in order for purification to be possible, a life must be given for a life. Adam and Eve, you're supposed to die. That includes us, the whole human race, gone. But God said, a life for life. A life for life. So he killed the two animals. That's why it had to be two. A life for life. Because the lifeblood is in the animal. And then you, I make you right with me. It's a life for life. And who provided the blood? God. God provided the blood. I don't want to get ahead of myself because I want to so bad. So now we have established that there is life in blood, right? And that blood brings things alive when it's sacrificed. That's why God is a God of covenants. Let's go to Genesis chapter 15, starting at verse 9. NLT, please. The Lord told him, he's talking about Abraham, bring me three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So Abraham presented all these to him, and he killed them. Then he cut each animal down the middle and laid the halves side by side. He did not, however, cut the birds in half. Do I want to go on? Let me see, let me see, let me see, let me see, let me see. Let me see. No. Give me Genesis 15, let's go down to the 17th verse. After the sun went down and darkness fell, Abram saw a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passing between the halves of the carcasses. So the Lord made a covenant with him that day. There was a sacrifice. There was a shedding of blood. The blood that was shed, because it has the lifeblood in it, made the covenant alive. God's a, blood, God's a God of blood, blood covenant. Another example of blood covenant we can find in Exodus chapter 24, verse 4. Then Moses carefully wrote down all, the instru- all of God's instructions. Early the next morning, Moses got up and he built an altar at the foot of the mountain. He also set up 12 pillars, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent some of the young Israelite men to present burnt offerings and to sacrifice for offerings as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses drained half the blood from these animals into basins. The other half he splattered against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it aloud to the people. Again, they all responded, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. We will obey. Then Moses took the blood from the basins and splattered it over the people, declaring, look, this blood confirms the covenant the Lord has made with you in giving you these instructions. There was blood. Blood was spilled. A covenant was made. The blood made the covenant alive. There's more to that. We're going to come to that later. But for this part, we're just establishing how God is a God of covenant, and he does all his covenants through blood. And then here's our favorite one that we like to quote all the time. Luke chapter 22, verse 20. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This is Jesus talking. So now God is establishing God blood visits. God is a God of blood because there is life in the blood. Now we've established all that. Now let's get to the meat of everything. Let's bring everything together. What does all that mean, Mark Summers? What? God's a God of blood. Yes. Okay. So what's the crux of the matter?
In Egypt, the children of Israel was instructed about the Passover. They would take the blood of the Passover and they were to put it on the doorpost and the lintel. The blood represented life because it was shed by a lamb. It also represented protection because God said, place the blood upon the door and the doorpost, the lantern and the doorpost. And when death comes, you'll be protected if, if you stay inside. So there has to be obedience in applying the blood. Yeah, take that, put that on there because that's going to come back later too. They were given the blood, but what if they didn't apply the blood? What if after they applied the blood, they went outside? They're, they're not protected. Death comes. Good. Death gets them. The blood also does something else. It heals. Yeah. By his stripes we are healed. Right. Yeah. We're talking about Jesus. We like that. By his stripes, Jesus, we're healed. But the blood back then, because it had what? It had life in it. It healed the Israelites. When they were behind the door, when they were behind the door and the blood was applied, they were eating a little meal, they were still sick and feeble. They were just eating a meal. But then the next morning, <laughs> when the door opened, <laughs> oh, you know, this is New Testament stuff too, right? <laughs> the next morning when the door opened and they passed through the fleshing floor and the blood covered them, they were healed. Because <laughs> not none of them came out feeble or lame. So the blood healed them. But they had to be obedient, right? They had to apply it the right way, understand it. It healed them. And they came out, but they were, they were baptized in the blood. They were covered in the blood. You know, 400 years of slavery will make you go down and do some stuff you don't want to do because you're in a different culture, you're a different environment. 400 years of slavery makes you adapt things you shouldn't be adapting, you know, because Egyptian, was, they was people of the world, right? They had all these gods and everything. They were doing all kinds of witchcraft and stuff like that. There was sin on top of sin on top of sin on top of sin. So when the blood was applied, life for a life. Life for life. Every Israelite got a new life. Life for life. Because all that sin that was in the camp of Israel, all that sin meant that God had to do what? Because of the sin. But God said, mm, I'm bringing my people out. I'm bringing my people out. And, and because of me, it's got to be life for a life. Life for, I know y'all been down there for 400 years sinning. I know y'all been doing things at the club y'all shouldn't be doing, but I love my people. A life for a life. A life for a life. A life for a life. And then we fast forward to now his people in the desert. He seals it with a covenant. Life for a life. <laughs> life for a life. And then comes. King Jesus. Because the sacrifice and stuff was getting out of hand. All right? Every single year, the high priest had to go into the temple. He had to offer the sacrifice for himself. He had to offer the sacrifice for the people. Because it's life for life. They were sinning. They were always sinning. They were, oh, God. <laughs> God, don't tell your face for me. Don't, don't hide your face from me. We have sinned. Please forgive us. Because the blood and, and animals of the lambs and the goats and the bulls had limited life. It was an everlasting life. So it was like the milk. It was like the milk inside your kitchen. It had an expiration date. I said every single time they had to reapply it. All right. And they were just sitting and everything. But they, they didn't understand that it was the blood that was being offered that was protecting them because they didn't understand the concept of Leviticus. It was a life for a life. Life for a life. So what did they start doing? Profaning the sacrifice. Giving bad blood. So what happens when you give bad blood? There's death in it. And then that bad blood don't stop the new death with the sin. Because sin does what? 
It brings death. That's what it does. I'm going to kill it. I'm going to kill this. I'm going to kill that. I'm going to kill this. I'm going to kill that. That's why there was rules and regulations of what kind of animals they could sacrifice because they had to be pure. It had to be pure life because of the expiration date. But it had to be pure, right? But then now they're getting all this mangled stuff up, and that mangled stuff can't deal with that sin because now you're just adding death on top of death. So now death is multiplying. There you go, Miss Dana just jumping in front of the car. Man. I'm just like, get back here now. So now it multiplies to death, and God's like, man, this ain't working. This is not working. <sighs> These people, they just keep on sinning. And you know, I love me some of my peoples, though, for real. I just love me some peoples. I know they just keep sinning and everything. I'm just going to have to do what I said I did in Leviticus. I'm just going to have to apply the blood myself. I'm just going to do it myself. I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to have to do it myself now because y'all just messing it up. Y'all ain't doing it right. I got expiration dates on the blood and then sin is still there and y'all making me hide my face. I don't want to hide my face because I want to bless you because I want to keep you alive and everything like that because I love you and I made you and I want to protect you. But now because of my holiness, something got to change. Something got to change. There's a change coming. Mm. Mm. So here, here comes King Jesus. Puts him in the form of man. But King Jesus had a surprise up his sleeve. He had blood. It didn't have no expiration date. Amen. It was the life force of God Almighty Amen. and flowing through the blood and the veins of a mortal man. But it was hidden. It was, it was hidden. It was cloaked in flesh. It was eternal blood. It was the life blood. It was the very life blood of God, the unceasing blood of God, the blood that keeps going and going and going. and It'll never run. It's like the energizer buddy. It just, a life die, he goes, I got some blood for that. Another life die, I got some blood from that. Oh, sin, I got some blood for that too. It's the life. So Jesus had to come. A new covenant had to be done because the old covenant wasn't working. All this blood stuff, expiration date, people were still sinning. And God's like, I got a way. Because God always got away. Yes. I got away. So he sends Jesus in a form of man. And everywhere Jesus went, he was, when he was crucified, he was spilling blood. They whipped him, spilled blood. They poked the beard out of his head, spilling blood. He got up there on the cross. They nailed his hands in, spilling blood. They nailed his feet in, spilling blood. And then the ultimate, they came with a spear, shoved it in his side, spilled blood and water. Jesus was covering our sins. He was giving us new life. But he was also establishing a new covenant at the same time. Jesus, at the same time, as he was giving and shedding all that blood, he was protecting you. As he was shedding all that blood, he was taking his, your infirmities, your sicknesses, and he's putting it on himself. Jesus, because Jesus, it was life for life. Disease for disease. Death for life. You got death, God got life. You got a disease, God got life. That's why people need to start pleading the blood of Jesus, because you don't understand what's in it. Plead the blood, just something happened in your life. Plead the blood of Jesus. Come on. Plead blood of Jesus. Tap into it. Tap into it. Tap into it. Tap into the blood, because the life is in the blood. It's in the blood. I got cancer. I got life. Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Blood of Jesus. Cancer, you ain't got no strength over me. I got the blood of Jesus because the blood of Jesus is life. I got the fountain. When's the last time you was under the fountain? Huh? When's the last time you went in your prayer closet and all you said was, plead the blood of Jesus. Wash me in your blood. Make me clean once again. I plead the blood of Jesus. Sin, you ain't got no hold on me. Sickness, you ain't got no hold on me because I'm under the covenant. But then we got to stop there because we get all stupid with that. Because we got to ask ourselves, are you obedient to the new covenant? Do you have the legal right to apply that blood to your life? Come on. Huh? Amen. The blood is available, but what you doing about the covenant? Because covenants are not just one-sided. Covenants got another side. So people forget about that now. They're like, oh yeah, I got a covenant with Jesus. I'm walking, I'm clean, I'm cleansed by the blood. Are you? Oh. Well, st st slow your roll now. Yeah. What you do? Oh, I'm, I'm responsible for something. I, I got something to do. Yeah, it's called being obedient. 
The only way the blood of Jesus will work in your life is if you are obedient. Mark, that's not, Mark, that's not, that's not true. Oh, it ain't? It's not? Let's go back to Exodus. When he gave the blood, he told them what to do with the blood, and they did it. What happened if they didn't do it? Ain't no protection. Ain't no life. Ain't no baptism into the new. Huh? So what's the, so how am I supposed to be? Okay, Mark, okay, okay, Mark, all right, all right. So Jesus died for my sins. Check, yes. Jesus' blood protect me. Check, yes. So Jesus, Jesus obviously did everything he's supposed to do according to the new covenant. So okay, Mark, okay, Mark, okay, Mark. Okay, I got you, bro, I got you. So what's my responsibilities so I can keep my end of the new covenant? So I can legally claim the protection of the blood. Because the Israelites, they could legally claim the protection of the blood because they, they applied it. It was given, but they applied it. Obedience is required. It is not an option. Disobedience equals sin. And if you are in sin, you are no longer covered by the blood. But you are considered a son of disobedience. And are in the territory and the control of, I know y'all don't want to hear this, Satan. Because he is the master and the controller of the children of disobedience, right? Okay, so watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. I'm not going to find it. Okay, so now the conditions of the new covenant. Number one, you got to love him. Number two, you got to follow him. Number three, you got to obey him. And number four, you have to live for his purposes and his interests. Because it was a great exchange, right? God made a new covenant. Now you got to remember something. It's life for life. And in this new covenant, it is the covenant of the spirit, right? Our new, we are a new creation. We are a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things become new. So when you come into the new covenant, Jesus stands at the door. He says, life for a life. Jesus, what does that mean? Your soulish life has to die for this new life to take effect. Your mind, your will, your emotions, they belong to me now. Amen. If you accept this covenant, now you ought to. <laughs> because it's full of better promises. It's full of healing. It's full of blessing. So God says, life for life. Lay down your life because I paid the price. You are not your own. Was it Romans, 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 yeah. Romans 14 and 8. Yeah, Romans chapter 14, verse 8. There we go. If we live, it is to honor the Lord. And if we die, it is to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Because he purchased us with his blood. Because he said, look, 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 I know y'all think that life is good, but it's, it's not. It's really, really not. So go ahead. It's called a great exchange. Go ahead, give it to me. Give it to me. Because I pay for it anyways. You belong to me, and you take this new life. All right? And then, and then, and then, and then I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to send the Holy Ghost. And he's going to come, he's going to teach you everything about how you, what you need to do, how you need to act in this new life so you can continue to have my protection because I'm here to protect you. I'm here to heal you because Jesus came to give you life and life more abundantly, right? But you got to apply the blood and for you to apply the blood legally and you do it the right way, you got to follow what he tell you to do. Why is that so hard for us? Because it's sin, Mark Summers. I understand that. But we get it under the blood. We plead the blood. And then God starts doing his work inside of us. It's the blood covenant. And then that gives us access into the spirit so that we can come before a holy God. See, everything was done so that you could come closer to God. Because the old way wasn't working. So God, Jesus, gave his blood. He fulfilled all of the old covenant. The sprinkling of the blood and getting into God's presence, you needed blood. And to see God, you needed blood. So we got to stay under the blood of Jesus. We come to the Father. We can pray boldly. That's why we, 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 always, we always so bold, giving our petition, because we're under the blood. So when, when God sees us, he doesn't see the sin. He doesn't, he doesn't turn his back. He sees the blood of Jesus, and he says, what you want? What you want? What you want? 
What you want? In Sunday school, we learned about how God teaches us how to get to him. Because a lot of the stuff in here in, 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 here, in, in the Psalms, we think it's just figurative and stuff like that. But when you get into the spirit, what's called a mountain of God, where God dwells, and that that mountain's holy. Really? Okay, watch this, watch this. Y'all looking at me funny. In the Old Testament, in Exodus, Mount Sinai, because God uses figures and types in the natural so he can explain something in the, in, in, in the spiritual, okay? So let's go here now. Come on, come on. So in the natural, Mount Sinai was called what? The mountain of God. And when God's presence came on Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai was the mountain because of the presence of God, because God is holy, was what? Holy. And nobody could touch it. This new life in the spirit, there's a mountain called the mountain of God. It's, it's Zion, right? Because of God's presence on, on the mountain, it makes it holy, right? But because we have the blood of Jesus, we can come up the mountain. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. This new covenant is better because the old covenant, you couldn't do that. You, you couldn't get the job. Only the priest could do that. But now God's making it personal. I want you to come see me. <laughs> You got to go through my son because he shed his blood and his blood cleanses you. And it's part of the new covenant that I made with mankind. But you got you to gotta have the blood. You, gotta, you can come to the mountain now. You don't need the high priest no more. You remember the, the new covenant was established to where everybody would know the Lord, that he would write their, his, his laws and his decrees on their heart by, by the spirit of God. And he would call them up to, to his mountain so that you can, we can commune one to another. He's no longer a distant guy. He's a personal guy. Come on up the mountain because you got the blood because Jesus sprinkled the blood. Come on up the, the, because the blood makes you holy. It's the blood, y'all. It's all about the blood. It's the blood of Jesus that gives us access to God so we can go into the throne room boldly because covered with the blood. Ain't no sin in me. I traded my life. I took that old life. I gave it to Jesus. Jesus gave me a new life. And now I can boldly come to God and get my petition. The other thing about the blood, now remember, Abel's blood was spilled and it was screaming out vengeance. Vengeance, vengeance, vengeance. Jesus went up into heaven, into the holies of holies, took his blood and sprinkled it seven times in the mercy seat. You know what Jesus' blood cries out? Mercy and forgiveness. Mercy and forgiveness. So when you're done wrong, you have an advocate with the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Father, forgive me. And then, and then here comes your advocate, the blood of Jesus. Oh, you got to forgive him. You got to forgive him. I paid the price for him. I paid the price for him. I did it. I shed that blood so they can, life for a life. It's already been paid. It's bought, stamped, and sealed. Life for a life. Life for a life. Life for a life. So live in Brebo, Kuva, and Reno, Father, we give you praise, honor, and glory, and we bless your name. We thank you for your loving kindness, your mercy, and your grace, Father. We thank you for shedding your blood for us so that we can be in communion with you daily, that we can come boldly into your presence, Father. And your spirit helps us to act right. Because <laughs> we struggle so bad, and you know we got sin in our lives, but when we apply your blood and we exchange life for life, we can come up that holy mountain with clean hands and a pure heart. If I got issues in my heart, I just ask that your blood would wash it. If I've done somebody wrong and my hands ain't clean and, 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 the, and the other person's blood is crying out against me so I can't come up your mountain, I pray that you would wash that from my hands too so I can have a clean hands and a pure heart and I can ascend your holy mountain and stand in your presence that you would bless me so I can bless other people. Father, wash us in your blood, all of us, from the top of our head to the soles of our feet so we can be clean and we can approach you so that you don't turn your face from us because we need your blessing. Because I'm not enough. I'm not enough. Can we meet here again? You're all I need. You're all I want. Can we meet here again? Bless now these people, Father. Fill them with your power, your might, Father. Let them always remember the power of your blood and what you did for them. And that they are part of the new covenant. You have done your part. Help them do theirs. 
in Jesus' name.